All right. We're going to uh, jump into our sermon, and today we are continuing our series called Credo. And we're going to spend the next several weeks exploring the Apostles' Creed. And um, I don't know if any of you, maybe some of you, grew up Lutheran or grew up in a more liturgical church, uh, maybe a Catholic church or an Episcopalian church. You'll be familiar with the Apostles' Creed. You'll probably know it by heart. If you've been worshiping with us for a while, you'll know it by heart if you're a member here, because we say it every single week. We say the Apostles' Creed. So we're going to spend the next several weeks just diving deep into the Apostles' Creed and, and seeing what Scripture has to say and why we recite this creed every week. And today we're looking at the first section, the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We're going to talk about what it means to be created and why God created us. And as I was uh, thinking about this sermon this week, um, something came to mind, and I was thinking about stories. Because, you know, the creed's kind of like a story. And stories are really important. They tell us where we come from, right? Sometimes we have family stories of our families came over from Germany or from uh, Sweden or something. We have family stories that tell us where we're from, and they tell us why we do the things that we do, right? And I have a couple family stories that I want to share with you guys that I think are pretty cool. This is um, a, a very old picture from probably about 1930, 1929. And uh, these two men, the one on the right-hand side is my great-grandfather. His name uh, was William Rambo. Isn't that a great, that's like a good strong name. And uh, my parents actually wanted to name me Rambo, but the Rambo movies came out just a couple years before I was born. So they nixed that. I kind of wish they would have done it anyway, because that would have been a sweet name. But that's William Rambo Cartmill. Uh, this is on my mother's side, and that's probably his older brother there with him. And you can see here they have a, a truck, a car here, with a service station. So my family, this is in a small town outside of Kansas City, and my family, they were mechanics. So they had this service station where they did some mechanic work on the first cars. They did batteries and tires and those types of things, oil changes. And it actually goes back several generations of my family. Before motorized vehicles, they, were, they created wagon wheels. And they, were, they did uh, carriage and cart maintenance and wagon maintenance uh, several generations back. So working on cars is something that's been passed down in my family, and you can see that here. But also the, there's a cool thing about this car. Does anybody know any antique vintage car buffs? Can you tell what that is right off the bat? No? That's a 1929 Chevy Roadster. So that was a big old big block V8s way back in the day. 1929 Chevy Roadster. And there's actually another picture with that older gentleman there, the older brother, along with their parents in front of a brand new 1928 Chevy two-door coach with the old V8 in it as well. So my family, uh, they bought Chevys. That's what they owned and that's what they worked on. And um, in fact, that got passed down all the way to my grandfather who only drove Chevy. He, in fact, I remember he had this late 90s Chevy S10 that was burgundy and gray stripes down the side, um, and I loved that truck. And he would always instill in us that Chevy is the right kind of car to have, and the wrong kind of car is a Ford. And so he said you can always tell a Ford truck is a Ford because the hood's open. That's what he said. And uh, in fact, when my wife and I got married, she was driving this little Ford Focus, and my grandfather gave me a hard time because now I was driving around this Ford. Um, he reminded me that that wasn't the right kind of car to have, and inevitably it would break down, and it, and it did. We had to change the transmission at 70,000 miles. Go figure. Another fun story along with this, since I'm trashing on Ford right now, um, is my neighbor. I don't know if you guys remember this. Probably six months ago or so, I gave a sermon on Envy, and I talked about my neighbor's truck. And he had this sweet Ford F-150 Lariat with the special ops trim. The thing was sick. It was awesome. And uh, a couple weeks ago, he stopped bringing the truck home, and he started driving this like courtesy car from uh, one of the local dealers in town. And I was like, oh, he must be getting a new, a new truck. I wonder what happened. And finally, he drove up with a new truck one day, and I happened to, to run into him, and so we were talking about it. And he said that his Ford, it, he had it for three years, and there was a hundred recalls in the three years that he owned that truck. And you know what I said to him? I said, well, it is a Ford. So that's, uh, that, that, that was your problem. And so the new truck that he pulled up in is this beautiful 2020 Chevy Silverado 1500. So now I'm even more envious than I was before because he's driving the right kind of truck instead of the wrong kind of truck. But my family is a Chevy family. The people in my family drive Chevy. And it goes all the way back to some of the first Chevys. 
This is another cool story. This is their parents, these two here. This is John and Evelina Cartmill. Um, they were both born north of Philadelphia in New Jersey. And John Cartmill, his parents uh, immigrated from Ireland during the potato famine. And his father was actually born at sea while his parents were traveling to the States, to Canada actually, during the potato famine. Can you believe that? Can you imagine making that trip in the mid 1800s, pregnant, nine months pregnant, and having your child on the way to the new world to build a new home for yourself? That's his father was born at sea to Irish parents coming during the potato famine. So they lived in Philadelphia, and then they are the ones who moved their kids outside of Kansas City. This is where my mom's family is from, right? And there's a story, stories that are associated with that, right? And it tells us where we're from. Stories kind of give us an identity, don't they? My family is, is an Irish family from Philadelphia that moved to outside of Kansas City to make a home for themselves, to build a business, and they, were worked on, uh, they worked on wagons and carriages and the early cars. That's what my family did. And that gets passed down to us, doesn't it? That creates an identity for us. But stories don't only tell us where we come from. Maybe some of you have stories like that. You have, you, maybe you live in the same farm that your grandfather and great-grandfather owned. Maybe you have your own stories of German or Scandinavian immigrants coming over and settling this area. Uh, but stories don't only tell us where we come from. They also tell us why we do things the way that we do much like my family drives Chevy because we've always driven Chevy. But here's another story. Right now it's, it's sweet corn season here and our neighbors are giving us just bags of sweet corn and we love it. Our kids are just, they're dogs with sweet corn. They love the sweet corn. Um, but I have my mother's side, her mother's side. I have a great, great, great grandfather who absolutely loved sweet corn and he loved to eat corn on the cobs and he could eat and eat and eat and eat corn on the cobs. And one day um, after he had a family and all that kind of stuff, one day and as, when he was older, he had eaten who knows how many corn on the cob. He had eaten a ton of corn on the cob and in the middle of supper, he keeled over right there, face first into a plate full of corn on the cob. He died in the middle of eating corn on the cob. And after that, it was passed down in my grandmother's family that children could not eat much corn on the cob at a time. They had to have one or two cobs, and then they had to wait a while, and then they could have another one. Then they had to wait a while, and then they had another one. So my mother's family, right, they didn't get to eat a whole lot of corn on the cob at one time because of something that had happened, right? That's a great story, isn't it? I love it. And it's true. That's all, that's all true. Um, so stories tell us where we come from. They tell us who we are. And they also tell us why we do the things that we do. We drive Chevy because we have always driven Chevy. We don't eat a lot of corn on the cob at one time because, you know, great, great, great grandpa died while eating corn on the cob. It tells us why we do some of the things that we do. And in the same way, the creed is a story. It tells us where we come from. And today we're going to hear about where we come from. It also tells us why we do the things that we do. So over the next several weeks, I encourage you to understand this creed as a story, a, a family story that gets passed down from one generation of Christian to the next, that tells us who we are, gives us an identity, and also tells us why we do the things that we do. So that's what we're going to look at today. So we're looking at the first section, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And we're going to use Psalm 193 to dive into this idea of being created by God and to the idea of this story, where we come from as we come from God. And this is a beautiful psalm. It's one of my favorites. And uh, it's very long, in case you guys didn't notice that. We read 16 verses this morning. Uh, we're not going to go back through all 16 verses. So we're going to start at the end. We're going to look at a few verses, and then we're going to jump to the beginning. But this is what the last uh, few verses of Psalm 193 says. It says this, For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. So we start off here. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
the psalmist is reflecting on this fact that God knows us so intimately that God already knew us when we were in our mother's womb, that the dark, mysterious womb where we don't get to see what happens, but God's already there forming us and developing us. And as, um, as I've been thinking about this, uh, I came across something interesting. Um, and did you guys know that at the moment of conception, there's a DNA strand that's made that is unique? We all have DNA. We all have 23 chromosomes. But each and every one of us has a unique strand of DNA. Our DNA is unique to us. Nobody before us has had identical DNA to you. Nobody after us has had identical DNA to you. That at the moment when a mother and a father love each other very much, there is a creation, a new thing that has never been seen before and never will be seen again. There's a uniqueness even at the very beginning. And the 23 chromosomes that we have, that very first strand of DNA, it tells a lot about us. In fact, that very first strand of DNA dictates uh, how tall we're gonna be. It dictates the, the frame, the shape of our body. It even can dictate uh, mental health or mental illnesses we might have or may not have. It tells us also what our personality is. There's a lot of things that happen, that are determined from that very first moments, those very first moments of creation. That very first strand of DNA tells us a lot about ourselves. And it's unique. It's never been seen before, and it will never be seen again. That's what the psalmist is reflecting on here. That God, even from those first moments, is knitting together an individual is knitting together a unique individual that cannot be replicated, cannot be remade. And uh, this is what the psalmist goes on to say, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. And these two words, fearfully and wonderfully, that, that second word wonderfully means distinctly, uniquely, which is what we were just talking about. That, that there is, you are a unique individual that has no duplicate. There's no double, right? There are maybe people that look like you, but your DNA is completely unique to you and no one has your exact DNA. That's that wonderfully made, distinctly made. But then we also have this word fearfully. And sometimes, um, Looking at the original language helps us understand the context and helps us understand the nuances of word. And, and in this case, uh, I was, as I was looking and reading, I saw some translators use um, with awe. You know, they would talk about that God made us with awe or those types of things. But when you look at the word itself, it actually doesn't mean anything else but being afraid. That's what that word fearful means, um, even in the original language. It just means being afraid. And I was thinking this week about how, how is it that God could be afraid of a person, right? How can God be afraid of making, how can God make something with fear in his own heart? And as I was thinking about it this week and reading some commentaries and um, praying about it, um, I think what, what occurred to me is this, that there's, there's a kind of limiting that God had to do to his own power, to his own authority, in order to make somebody else with their own will, right? Because God isn't a puppet master. He's not, some, he's not gonna twist our arms. He kind of, he creates us and we have our own will. We're responsible for our own life in many ways. When God creates us and he gives us a will, he kind of limits his own power a little bit, doesn't he? And it's just like with uh, my wife and I, right? My wife and I have known each other for 10 years. We've been, uh, we were dating for four years. We've been married for six years. And my wife still surprises me, even after knowing her for a decade. And maybe some of you who've been married for decades, quite a long time, your spouse can still surprise you from time to time, right? There are some times where your spouse says something or does something that you weren't expecting. Even your own kids, who you know very well, sometimes still surprise you. Because there's, at some point, you can't fully know what somebody else is thinking, right? 
that there being another person, you really, you don't always know exactly what that person is going to do, right? There's, and there's almost a kind of fear that comes along with that, a respect that comes along with that. And I think that's what's going on here. And we're going to hear that God knows the path that we're going to walk. He knows what we're going to say, but it's still our responsibility to do it, to say it, to live our life. It's our responsibility to work and to serve and to love and to do those things. He knows what we're going to do, but he doesn't control it. And so I think that's what's going on here with this word fearfully, is that God has created a unique individual with a will, and he has given it to the world. And then he's kind of, he can do some things, he can influence, he can speak, he can guide, he can empower the Holy Spirit, but that person is still responsible for themselves in some ways. And that's what I think is going on here with that word fearfully. And then the psalmist continues, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And this word frame, it literally means body, physical body. That God knew what our physical body was going to be. That the frame was not hidden from God, even as we were being woven in the womb. And this is what I want to say about this. I I added this verse, not added this verse. I'm talking about this verse because I want to make a point here. Is that we do a lot of, we spend a lot of time disliking our bodies. Okay? You and I both do this. We spend a lot of time disliking our bodies. We think we're too fat, too skinny, not pretty enough. We wish that we could be stronger, whatever, right? We spend a lot of time disliking our own bodies. And as we get older, um, we spend a lot of time disliking our own bodies because they're falling apart, because things are failing and we're weaker and we're not as healthy as we used to be. But this verse makes a point here that even Even down to your body, God knew what you were going to look like. He knew what you were going to be shaped like. And he created you that way. What these verses tell us is that you are not an accident. God made you the way you are. From your body, to your mind, to your personality, to your skill sets, to your passions. God made you on purpose. You are not an accident. You are not a mistake. God made you the way that you are on purpose. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, creator of me, with my body, with my mind, with my passions, with my skills. I am not an accident. You are not an accident. You are on purpose. And that's our identity, is beloved children of God who are created by him. That's our identity. And here's the interesting thing, is that after we're resurrected, later on we're going to talk about the resurrection several weeks down the road, And at the resurrection, it's actually our bodies that are going to be resurrected, and we are are our bodies. We're going to live in these bodies for all of eternity. Now, we know they're going to be glorified, they're going to be different, but you are still going to be the same stuff that you are now. Jesus' disciples, after a moment of not recognizing him, they recognized him. They knew it was Jesus. They could tell by his face. They could recognize who he was after a moment because it was still his body that was resurrected, just like it's going to be your body that's resurrected. You are not an accident. You are on purpose. God designed you uniquely with your passions and your will and your mind and your body on purpose. All right? That's our identity. It's created in God. And the psalmist actually uh, earlier says this. Not only do we have an identity, but this is also the psalmist says, you search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind me and before me, and you lay your hand upon me. So it says here, you search out my path. Like I said before, um, God creates us 
And he creates us with a will. So in lots of ways, um, God can guide us, but God doesn't dictate who we're going to be married to. He doesn't dictate what kind of career we're going to have. He doesn't dictate those kinds of things. So he creates us with a will so we can kind of go throughout our life and go down our path, but he knows the path. He searches out the path before we go there. As we walk along and as we lay down, we read later that he actually hymns us in. He protects us from before and from behind. He knows where we're going and he's already out ahead of us, protecting us and establishing the way that we're going to go, encouraging us and sending us and empowering us forward. So not only do we have an identity, but we also have purpose. We have something to do. We have a path that we are walking down. And uh, this reminds me, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he gave two answers. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he says, and the second is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So the Lord establishes us, he unleashes us into the world, and he gives us a job to do. Our job is to love our neighbors as ourselves to love and to serve our neighbors. And I'll tell you what, you can love and serve your neighbors if you're a teacher, if you work at the hospital, if you're a business owner, if you're a factory worker at Wall Clippers, whatever it is that you do, you can love and serve those people who are around you. If you have a spouse, that's your neighbor. If you have kids, that's your neighbor. If you have a workplace, your coworkers are your neighbors. Your bosses are your neighbors. Your employees are your neighbors. All the people in your actual physical next door neighbors are also your neighbors. Wherever you go, wherever you interact with people, those are your neighbors. And so although God doesn't dictate what kind of job we're gonna have or who we're gonna marry, at the end of the day, we may have many different paths, many different careers, but we all have one job. And that job is to love and to serve our neighbors. Our purpose is to love and serve those around us. I like to say that Christians should be the best employees, should be the best coworkers. We should throw the best parties. We should be the best bosses. Because the singular mission, wherever wherever we work, whatever it is that we do, our purpose is to love and to serve those who are around us. That's why we want to do our work as best as we can. That's why I want to work with excellence. That's why we want to make sure that we are being responsible with our finances. That's why I want to make sure that our marriages are healthy and our kids are healthy is because we're trying to love and serve the world and that's hard right, if you don't work well. That's hard if you don't treat your wife well. That's hard if you don't treat your kids well, right? We love and serve those around us so that we can better love and serve those around us. That's our purpose. We have lots of careers. We have lots of things going on, lots of different families, but we have one job, to love and to serve our neighbors. And it says here that God hymns us in behind and before that God is already working ahead of us. And he's already encouraging us from behind and pushing us and empowering us to move forward. That's our work. And so this story of the creed gives us an identity and it gives us a purpose. And this is what we hear today, that God created you with an identity. A unique individual that the world has never seen before and the world will never see again. He's also created you with a purpose, that whatever family you have, whatever career you have, you are to love and to serve your neighbors, to make life better for your coworkers, for your bosses, for your spouse, for your employees. God created you with an identity and with a purpose. That's what the creed tells us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. Amen. Let's pray.